this lecture, I'm going to talk about the angiosperm plant body, so that's about flowering plants, and specifically discussing the structure function of uh, plant leaves. Leaves are part of the shoot organ system. The leaf is the organ. Um, and while there are modified leaves, which we will see later in the lecture, the main function of most leaves is being the place where photosynthesis occurs. Kind of the sub-functions of a leaf that go along with the fact that it's the site of photosynthesis is that it um, acts to capture the light energy, which is the input for photosynthesis, exchange gases, which is necessary for photosynthesis, regulate water loss, and do the photosynthesis itself and the chloroplasts, and also then export the sugar um, products to the rest of the plant. The initial product uh, of photosynthesis, as always, is G3P. And then in plants, though, it gets um, converted into sucrose, and that is what is actually transported from the leaf to the rest of the plant body. So you can see here's a leaf, and there's a cut through. And um, so this is a cross section. You can see that there are different features. So we've got capturing light is basically a uh, service area, and then, of course, the um, photosystems uh, in the chloroplasts. And uh, exchanging gas, you can see CO2 going in and O2 coming out through the stomata, or stoma, singular. Um, that's also what is used to regulate water loss, closing and opening those. Photosynthesis again happens in the chloroplast like the light energy capture, and then the export of the products to the rest of the plant is occurring through the vein. So that's what we call the vasculature in the um, leaves veins. The external structures are what facilitates this light energy capture, particularly the blade of the leaf. That's like the flat part, the flat big part that you usually see. Um, and it increases the surface area for the light capture. And some um, leaves are uh, sessile to where they're basically just attached straight to the plant stem. And some have this feature here called a petiole and the petiole is advantageous because the leaves can um, adjust to the sun. Some plants actually uh, actively adjust their leaf um, angle, and then they can catch the sun throughout the day at the different angles, um, and the, the, petiole, the petiole allows that to occur. Wherever the leaf is attaching to the plant is called a node, uh, and that's through the petiole here, and then between that leaf and the stem, is this uh, axillary bud, which is showing you, A, that this is a leaf. So wherever a leaf is attached to a stem, you should always see an axillary bud. Sometimes they're very small and hard to see on real plants, but um, it should be there. Uh, and then the axillary bud is where you get the branches growing from, new branches, flowers, thorns. All those things are going to come from those axillary buds. The vasculature, meaning the xylem and phloem, is in veins, as I mentioned, and uh, veins can be arranged in um, two main ways. One is parallel veins, and remember with monocot, eudicot, and, and these classifications here, we're, we're talking about flowering plants. So other plants also have veins in their leaves too, um, but you can't look at a non-flowering plant and say, oh, it has branching veins, it's a eudicot, because remember, eudicot monocot only applies to angiosperm plants. Um, within the angiosperms, so parallel veins here, which means uh, they go up and down from the uh, attachment point of to the plant to the tip of the lead blade, are called parallel veins, and that is a monocot feature. So like, if you go outside and look at grass, all grass is monocots, and they will have this um, parallel vein structure. Eudicots have branching veins that can look uh, in various ways, but the main idea is that they have a main vein and then branches off of that. When we look at a cut through, the internal structure of a leaf, um, it has the three main tissue types, as usual, dermal, ground, and vasculature. And the things that I'm concerned, I'll go through about you knowing for our purposes, I'll go through in um, step by step here. 
which you'll basically see this is the top side of the leaf, this is the bottom side. We've got a lot of cells in there and then we've got this vein going on. So what features of the leaf are involved in gas exchange and regulating water loss? One is on the outside of the leaf, both on the uh, underside and the top side. It's called the cuticle. Cuticle is a waxy layer that helps prevent water loss. The waxes are uh, lipids, which are hydrophobic. And cuticles can be different thicknesses, and that often is reflective of where the plant's able to live. So plants that live in are able to live in very um, hot, dry environments tend to have thick cuticles, which allow them to exist there without drying out. Um, the stoma, plural stomata, are these uh, features here, which have two guard cells surrounding an opening. And the um, the hole itself, the stoma, is where the uh, gas uh, CO2 is coming in that's going to be made into the sugar. And the O2 is going out because that's a byproduct of photosynthesis. Most um, stoma are on the undersides of leaves in general. And the guard cells can um, operate to open and close those stomata, which we'll see in a moment. When the gas comes in, or when it's waiting to come out, in eudicots, you can see there's actually two different um, kind of cell arrangements here. And one of them is called spongy mesophyll. And you'll see the cells are spread out in the spongy mesophyll. Um, and that's actually allowing there to be air pockets. So when the CO2 comes in, it has a place that it can um, kind of exist until it gets taken in by the chloroplast um, during photosynthesis. And then when the oxygen is produced and it diffuses out of the chloroplast and then out of the cell, um, it will be in this air pocket area until it leaves through the guard cells. The process by which the guard cells open and closed the process by which the guard cells open and close is uh, tightly regulated and is able to occur because of the uh, structure of the cell. So it's like a structure function idea. Uh, so one thing that's going on is that the, um, the physical features of the cell itself, the guard cells, um, allow this opening and closing. So basically what happens is that when guard cells are turgid, and you might recall that term from bio one, you talked about tonicity. So turgid means that they are, um, uh, their central vacuoles here are full of water and pushing against the sides of the cellulose cell wall. And that makes them real, I think of it as plumpy. Uh, and then when they're flaccid, which means that the central vacuole has lost water and the pressure against the cell wall is not very great, they're closed which might seem sort of counterintuitive because you think if they're plumpy, it would shrink the hole, but here's why not, that doesn't happen. So the guard cells are um, uh, tightly attached to each other at the tips. So that means that when they get plumpy, they're not going to push apart, turgid, push apart from each other, they're still attached. Um, and the reason they make this bending sort of shape, part of that, is also um, the orientation of the cellulose microfibrils. So you can see here, we call this radial orientation, because it's all going towards, I mean, uh, sort of like one point, in this case, sort of the middle of the cells. And this radial orientation, uh, when it gets turgid, you can see it sort of straightens out. And so that also promotes the cells making a curved shape, which ends up making a hole. And the way that the water is regulated, whether it's inside in high amounts or low amounts, meaning it's uh, causing the cell to be turgid or flaccid, is through the movement of potassium ions. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of details. Um, I've decided for our class, unless I let you know differently, we're not talking about water potential and, and things along those lines. But the basic idea here is that it's an active process, which is not surprising, right? Because the accumulation of particles in a higher concentration area is going to take 
some sort of energy to do that um, because the particles don't um, uh, don't naturally accumulate in higher amounts, right? I, uh, the the equal distribution or concentration is most uh, is. And it's not surprising it's an active process because accumulating particles in a higher concentration in one area than another is um, not the natural um, state of how particles move. And so the way this co-transport is the active process that uh, the active transport occurring here is a co-transport process. The part that's using energy is uh, a potassium the part that's using energy directly is a proton pump or hydrogen ion pump, and that's coupled with um, potassium channels, which ultimately uh, allow the movement of the potassium into the cell. And then, because potassium is higher inside the cell, that drives water to go inside and fill the central vacuoles, and therefore the cells become turgid. Large amounts of water movement, if you recall, are facilitated by the channels called aquaporins. And you don't need to know details, but those are also involved. So that's when the stoma is open. And then to close it, so that causes the stoma to be open. And then when it closes, the potassium ions are released to the environment and the water follows and therefore it becomes flaccid. There are a number of stimuli that um, will cause the closing of stomata, but one of them is um, water deficiency, meaning drought or very hot conditions. And um, this releases, uh, or the water deficiency causes abscisic acid to be produced. That's a hormone, which means it's a signaling molecule. And that signaling molecule ultimately results in the stomata closing. Not surprisingly, um, like many biological processes, there are trade-offs with closing stomata. Um, a benefit of that is water loss is reduced, which is good for the plant. Um, costs of closing stomata is that less CO2 is able to be taken in because you know the hole is literally closed. And remember, CO2 is needed to build that carbon compound. That's where the carbons come from. So therefore, you make less food for the plant. And also, there, uh, the oxygen can't get back out. That's a byproduct of photosynthesis. And you may recall that high levels or high concentrations of oxygen can actually cause photorespiration, which is basically photosynthesis running backwards. So it uses ATP instead of making some. It, breaks down the carbon compound instead of making it. So this is very uh, unproductive for the plant. Um, so there has to be a balance. And uh, the most important reason, actually, plants need water is really to keep the stomata open. Features involved in photosynthesis itself and then getting the product of photosynthesis to the rest of the plant. Um, the majority of photosynthesis is occurring in the mesophyll cells. So in eudicots, which is what we're looking at here, is specifically this palisade mesophyll. Uh, you might also hear it called palisade parenchyma. Um, and so those are um, cells with lots of chloroplasts in them, and that's where the photosynthesis is occurring. In monocots, photosynthesis also occurs in the mesophyll cells. It's just only one layer. After um, the sugars are made, they are going to get transported and exported to the veins. So the vein is surrounded by this bundle sheath cell layer. And then you have the xylem and the phloem. Now, this is xylem phloem should be pointing down here. That's the phloem and that's the vein. And um, the water is coming into the leaf and the minerals into the leaf from the roots through the stem. And then the phloem is where the sucrose 
from photosynthesis will be loaded and transported to the rest of the plant. So this is the this is like the cartoon we've been looking at the eudicot. So I'll just go to the right first the eudicot. So I'll just go to the right first. So there's our epidermis on the top and the bottom. Here is uh, you can see there there's guard cells and there's a stoma. Um, you can see the palisade parenchyma. It's the top more packed layer. You can see the spongy mesophyll. See how spread out it is down here? Palisade mesophyll. And then uh, here is our um, main vein. So we're looking at the two mesophyll layers tell you it's eudicot, and then we have one main vein with other veins branching off. Versus a monocot, you can see the parallel vein structure here. And also there's just one mesophyll layer. Um, here you can really nicely see the guard cells and the stoma. There's guard cells with the stoma. And there's air pockets in here. So all this is mesophyll and does the, photo, the photosynthesis happens in there. Leaf growth, it occurs at the apical meristems, the regions of stem cells. And um, so it's gonna be at the uh, tips of the shoots. You can see these are um, like new forming leaves. It's a lot of um, cell division occurring here at the tip. These are also some relatively new leaves that have formed as well. And then there's the node, because this is the stem. So where the leaf attaches to the stem is that's the node region. Um, leaves, unlike stems and roots, have a determinate growth. So the leaves don't just keep on growing and growing and growing, unlike what the stem can do and what the roots can do. When the days get shorter and there's less light, the plant um, downregulates chlorophyll production, and so the chlorophyll that's present breaks down. And so what that means is that whatever um, other pigments are present that break down slower are able to be seen. So chlorophyll appears green to our eyes, the wavelength of light, that's what our eyes detect and our brain interprets that as green. And um, so once that goes away, if there are carotenoids present, which are just different pigments, remember pigments are molecules that absorb light and then um, reflect some light and that gives us uh, colors to see. So carotenoids are yellow and orange appearing pigments and they break down slower than chlorophyll. So once the green chlorophyll goes away, you're able to see the orange and yellow type pigments now. You might also see leaves that turn red and red is uh, in leaves is due to these pigment group called anthocyanins, um, but they are not always present. Some leaves have them, especially new leaves. And um, But on the leaves in autumn that turn red, it's actually upregulating new production of anthocyanin pigments. And there's some hypotheses about why that happens, uh, one of which is that it could deter insects from laying eggs on the leaves or on the plant and um, they would hatch in the spring and that could be detrimental to the plant. So that's one hypothesis there. But that's the reason you can see those colors is because the green chlorophyll is gone. But the orange and the yellow are actually always there. Leaves also are um, shed or undergo abscission uh, during uh, autumn time. It's a cost benefit situation as why some trees lose leaves. Leaves are the site of photosynthesis, so they're making sugars, which the plants need to do cellular respiration and then make ATP to run their cells. But of course, leaves are also tissue, so they consume sugars and they consume ATP and require water. And so there is a benefit of the photosynthesis, but at a certain point when there's not enough light or little amounts of light, it costs more to maintain the leaf than it is for the than the benefit of the leaf making the food, and so that's one of the reasons leaves um, undergo abscission and fall off of, and uh, that's um, regulated by the uh, levels of auxin and ethylene hormones. Now, just to let you know, there is a hormone called abscisic acid, which they used to think was involved in this and that's why they named it. But it actually looks like it's more ethylene 
and then the oxen relationship, not abscisic acid. So don't get confused with that. The ethylene levels are increased. Uh, they lead to this um, formation of an abscission layer. So basically between the stem and the petiole, and eventually that uh, weakens the leaf and then it ends up falling off. One modification of leaves are present on carnivorous plants. These are plants that are going to capture and digest animals, usually insects, uh, and they do that with their leaves. So this part that closes on a Venus flytrap and this pitcher part on the pitcher plant, those are both highly modified leaves. These plants are green, so that tells us they, they probably do photosynthesis, which they do. So they're making their own uh, carbon compounds. They make the sugars. And so why are they, quote, eating then? So these um, are mostly getting the nitrogen from the animals that they are consuming. And that allows them to live in environments that are low in nitrogen, like bogs and such. There is also a, a large group of plants called succulents, and some of those have modified leaves. If you watch the stem lecture, some succulents have modified stems, like cacti, but um, other ones have modified leaves. So aloes are a classic example. We have agave plants. So you'll notice the leaves are quite thick and that is allowing them to store water. You also notice that the cuticles are very thick and so that waxy layer prevents water from evaporating. And then you'll also see that a lot of times your agaves and aloes are in this sort of uh, conical whirl and that actually, when it does rain, which is rare in dry environments, uh, it, it directs the water down into the place where the roots are going to be. You can also see on the edge of this agave these little mm, teeth, and so that is a kind of spine. Other spines are also the uh, cactus-type spines. So those are all modified leaves and that is um, preventing herbivory, meaning organisms eating those uh, plants. Particularly in a dry environment, the plant's a source of water, and so it's just the teeth on here that's, that's the spine part of the leaf, but this, the pokey parts of a cactus, are entirely leaves. So that's the whole leaf, it, the spike is just highly modified there. So it, it, besides preventing herbivory, they're also very low surface area on cacti, so they don't lose um, water through the stomata, and uh, they don't do photosynthesis. The uh, stem is going to be the part that does that. There's a plant modification called a tendril, uh, and it's a feature that allows the plant to wrap around structures and climb to better access uh, sunlight, as well as to be able to um, you know, hold itself up and become bigger than it would um, if it couldn't wrap around and hold on to something. Um, tendrils can be uh, derived from a number of different plant parts, so uh, they can be modified shoots by our branches, they can be modified reproductive structures or flowers, and also um, they can be modified leaves. So pea plants uh, are the, maybe the most well studied of the tendril producing uh, plants in the sense like of actually studying the tendrils, and they are uh, leaf derived tendrils. So you can see here the leaves are um, and actually, the, this whole thing is the leaf, and then uh, this is this, um, the stem here. And so you can see the leaflets uh, across from each other, and here's two tendrils across. So they're just, instead of forming a leaflet there, it formed tendril on both sides in this case. So that's how it would look if it's a, a leaf-derived tendril. Uh, sometimes also this is a cat's claw creeper. These two pictures are um, drawings of a trumpet creeper. And you can see here two examples of tendrils. Uh, so it could be the uh, third of this leaflet could be a tendril, or you know that could also even branch more. And you can see that here. So here's, um, you can see, right, axillary bud. So this whole thing is the leaf. There's leaflets and there's modified leaflets, which are tendrils. You might have seen tendrils on pumpkins or cucumbers or melons. Sometimes people grow those things. Those are all actually um, branch-derived modifications uh, to make tendrils. And then something like uh, grapevines uh, are modified um, reproductive structure-type tendrils. 
Another type of modified leaf that is uh, attracting pollinators is called a bract. And often these are mistaken for petals because they are um, colored, which we usually think of as petals, and they are on the part of the plant you think of where a flower should be. So you can see though, if you look, that these parts are the bracts, poinsettias are classic bract, bougainvilleas, this is a dogwood, uh, and this is a good shot because you can actually see clearly that the flower is this white part in here, and here's your poinsettia flowers and the dogwood flowers. And so um, the bract does attract and give a place for the um, pollinators to land, but it is actually a leaf. And you can see the vasculature in there as well. You can see the veins. You can see that. There are also storage leaves. Um, and a good example is an onion. The onion part is, is a tiny part stem, but most of it is these modified fleshy leaves. And in this case, they are storing oil. And um, that is a a lipid, which can be used for energy. Uh, they also store phenolic compounds, which is what makes the onion have a very pungent smell and taste, and those in general are um, deterrents of herbivory, so preventing them from getting eaten. There are floating leaves that have a, usually a very large surface area. Their stomata are located on the top of the leaf instead of primarily on the bottom, because to access the gas it needs to be exposed to the air versus the water side, so these are water lily example. And then lastly, let's talk about some economic roles of leaves. So like most plant, like I would say all plant parts, uh, leaves can be eaten. If you're gonna use this on your exam, you need to know specific examples. Um, so we have you know, lettuce, kale, onions, garlic, spinach, celery, is a leaf and not a stem, which might surprise you, but here's the tiny stem, and there's the petiole, very enlarged, and there is the blade off the end. And so these are actually part of leaves. We also have um, uh, allium species, so besides just onions, scallions, um, you got leeks, chives, Herbs like basil, parsley, oregano, rosemary, bay leaves, all of those are leaves. Uh, stevia comes from a leaf, sugar substitute, so it's a sweet molecule. And uh, Brussels sprouts are also uh, leaves. You can see that they're axillary um, buds and with really tight leaves on there. So they form at all those axillary buds. Some other things that I thought of, and you probably can think of other uses of leaves, uh, were drinks. All drinks that are technically tea are made from the same species of plant, Camellia sinensis. Um, there is variations on it, black tea, green tea, white tea, oolong, but they're all just like different maturities, uh, mostly of this same species. There's also tisanes, or you can say tisans, which are um, include herbal teas. So not really teas, they're tisans instead, um, but they are could be made of leaves, like mint leaves which is not the camellia species, but can make a drink. Drugs like tobacco and cocaine that comes from coca leaves have important economic impacts. Some medicine comes from leaves like uh, aloe vera from burns. And if you have an aloe vera plant, you can just snap open the leaf and use that um, uh, fluid inside. Ginkgo is a gymnosperm and um, it's kind of touted as being good for memory, although the evidence for that is limited. Then there are also goods that are made from leaves, papyrus, that very old paper that was made, well known by the Egyptians. Um, if you, you know, have uh, simple huts, the roofs can be made of leaves. Uh, the dye, the blue dye for jeans or denim uh, is made from leaves as well. So that should give you enough information to have a basic idea of the leaf structure function, adaptations, and economic roles.